1968, George A. Romero revolutionized horror with Night of the Living Dead, a searing, terrifying film that shocked audiences used to a campier approach that had defined the 60s, and the film that created the modern flesh-eating zombie. In 1990, The Night would come again with Tom Savini's remake of Romero's classic. But while the original is one of the most famous horror films of all time, Savini's remake has largely been lost in the shuffle of the endless horde of zombie movies. And although the original Night is a horror cornerstone, its remake was designed to make up for a crucial flaw. When Romero's original was created, it was originally titled Night of the Flesh Eaters. But due to another film already having this title, the film was renamed Night of the Living Dead at the last minute. The problem was that the renamed film was printed without a copyright notice, eliminating Romero, John Russo, and Russell Striner's copyright over the film, entering it into the public domain and letting anyone distribute it and play with it as they saw fit. Afterward, Romero and Russo would go their separate ways in their visions for the dead, only to come back together for a remake to recoup the money and copyright that was lost along the way. What is the story behind 1990's Night of the Living Dead remake? What critical changes set it apart from the original? And what is the legacy of Savini's film that was destined to live in the shadow of the original? Let's explore Romero, Zombies, and the Living Dead series at a crossroads, encapsulated in a single film that dared to remake a pillar of horror. Nicknamed the King of Splatter, special effects makeup artist Tom Savini started practicing at an early age after being inspired by Lon Chaney. However, Savini's work on film would have started much earlier if it wasn't for the Vietnam War. With the draft underway, Savini enlisted as an army photographer to avoid combat. And in 1968, Savini was set to create the makeup on Romero's original night until he was called up by the military. There, what Savini experienced would forever change him as a person and as an artist, saying, I had to click off my emotions as a combat photographer in Vietnam to not go nuts. But when I came back, those emotions were still turned off. I was a zombie. Coming back from Vietnam, I was an emotionless person. Seeing that stuff affected how I was to create makeup effects from that point on. After his time in the military, Savini returned to film, breaking through and forming a long partnership with George Romero working on films including Martin, Dawn, and Day of the Dead. Savini became both beloved and infamous for creating some of the most gruesome effects ever seen. He also tried his hand at directing multiple episodes of Tales from the Dark Side, hoping his effects work would help him break through to directing and acting like his hero Cheney. And given his successful partnership with Romero, the zombie creator immediately turned to Savini to direct the remake of Night of the Living Dead while he was busy working on The Dark Half. But why a remake? Following night, co-writers George Romero and John A. Russo disagreed over where to go with a sequel, leading to a falling out between the two and a split in rights, with Russo taking the rights to the term Living Dead. Romero would go on to make his socially conscious Dawn and Day, while Russo would eventually co-create Return of the Living Dead. In the years between, Romero and Russo struggled to retain the rights to Night and squash unauthorized reproductions of their original film, but never had real control over what was done due to the copyright failure. In 1986, Hal Roach Studios created a colorized version of Night for home video without the producer's involvement. This was the wake-up call that something needed to be done with Night before it fully slipped from Romero and Russo's hands, bringing them back together with Russell Striner to produce an official remake. With a script solely written by Romero and with Russo and Striner in the producer role, Savini was set to finally take part in the dead film he missed out on. But things wouldn't be easy. I had apprehension, of course, in doing the remake, said Savini. My approach was to pretend we didn't see the original film, although I did use your awareness of the original film to manipulate you. We really had to remind people what death was. I didn't want to ever use the word zombie in the remake. These are dead things. Like the original, Romero's new script follows Barbara and her brother, Johnny, who are suddenly attacked by a zombie, with Johnny killed and Barbara meeting Ben in a remote house, where they join several more survivors. Most importantly, the combative Harry and his family, as they're slowly mobbed by a growing undead horde. Savini's Night takes place in 1989, but given its rural setting and lack of differentiating factors, it's largely timeless. 
In fact, Savini specifically wanted his characters to look similar to the original. Really, the biggest differentiator outside its widescreen color is its modern, grotesque approach to the zombie. Much more in line with Savini's fleshy zombies of day instead of the prototype ghouls of the original night, or even Savini's pale blue dead of dawn. To make the look, Savini and his effects crew took a more clinical approach to what a dead body looks like including a trip to an autopsy for examples. Overall, the 1990 remake follows the story beats, character dynamics, and rules of the original. But there are several critical changes that make this story feel different and wind up with its own unique ending. Of course, it's more graphic but not all that much. Its widescreen color creates a very different atmosphere, and several iconic moments are churned on their head to keep viewers off guard. Savini and Romero set this precedent early on with their graveyard opening, teasing the arrival of our first zombie, only for it to be a wounded, grieving mourner, quickly disrupted by a zombie jump scare. But the most important change is around the character of Barbara, here played by Patricia Tallman. The original Barbara is a traumatized, shell-shocked victim who starts as our would-be protagonist, only to be near comatose for much of the movie. Her role at the head of the film suddenly is supplanted by Dwayne Jones' Ben as she recedes. The remake leads us to believe that this Barbara will follow the same path, on the run from the cemetery and saved in the farmhouse by Tony Todd's Ben, only to snap out of her stupor and become a ruthless survivor. This is a Barbara on the other end of the rise of the final girl, no longer a damsel in distress, but someone altered by her horror experience and never looking back. In some ways, she's more Ellen Ripley or Sarah Connor than your typical zombie character. Purists might scoff at the change, but I find it to be fascinating. Romero's original will always be there, so why not make a new film that reflects how its creators have changed in the years since? After all, Dawn and Day of the Dead do something very different with their central women. I find the original night to have too much on its plate with its issues of socioeconomic strife and race relations to be able to truly address the role of female agency as seen through the lens of horror. But in Savini's night, Barbara's struggle becomes equal to Ben's. Barbara's changes and her fully developed storyline cut through the narrative and in turn change both Ben and Harry's characters. Ben becomes an even more complicated character, contending with Harry's selfish actions as well as Barbara's own strong-willed fight for survival that doesn't mesh with either man's approach. Harry becomes a much shallower character, now completely selfish, drunk, and abusive to his family, the major shortcoming of the film. Night of the Living Dead was Todd's breakthrough role, and while Candyman solidified him as horror royalty, his turn here shows him in a light that his most famous roles don't take advantage of. Candyman, Bloodsworth and Final Destination, and a lot of voiceover roles are all about taking advantage of the menace in that dark, gravelly voice. But like Dwayne Jones has been, Todd's character is struggling to keep himself and his mini-society together, cracking under the immense, horrible pressure they're under. And I'd say Todd's version is much more flawed and falling apart than the original. After all, this becomes Barbara's movie by the end. Given the context of the original, the running tension is whether Barbara will succumb to the pressure of the undead and fall apart. But by the end, she is the only one that keeps it together, fully understanding the nature of the undead and their reflection of humanity. They're us. We're them and they're us. She's not comatose. She's totally lucid. With her at the center, Ben and Harry fall apart in different directions. Some characters' fates change, but the original's tension of upstairs and downstairs, reflecting societal tensions, remains, but is also given a third option. Barbara's instinct to escape and not be a sitting duck for the undead. Whatever I lost, I lost a long time ago, and I do not plan on losing anything else. In the end, Barbara is proven right, leading to the film's biggest change. After an entire movie of violence, loss, betrayal, and an increasing sense that every action is futile, Ben and Harry shoot each other and barricade in different parts of the house, as Barbara takes her chances outside. What I really like about this night is that since it was created after decades of films solidifying the idea of the zombie, these walkers abide by the rules of the undead. That means Helen is no longer stabbed to death by her trowel-wielding zombie daughter, an iconic and extremely unnerving moment in the original. 
but it also means that these slow movers can be outmaneuvered in small groups, only becoming truly dangerous in large numbers and small spaces. Ultimately, the movie proves Barber right. There's another one for the fire. And you know what? Let's go ahead and let people on the internet be mad at me for the hundredth time. Let's discuss the idea of a strong female character, specifically in horror. In general, I think this is a term that's been diluted, misused, and adopted by both studios to pat themselves on the back, and by angry fans to scream at creators for being too woke. Another misused term. The idea of a strong female character is way too often used to define a woman in a story who is physically powerful, or able to overcome literal obstacles in a story. That's a female character who is strong. That's not what this should actually apply to. A strong female character is a woman in a story who is well-written, with an internal life and an interesting arc. That's a strongly characterized female. Got it? Okay, so Barbara in Romero's original night is neither of these things. She's not physically strong enough to survive, and she's not well-written either. Both are due to her being so completely traumatized throughout the movie. And most controversially, what I'd like to say is that that's totally fine. Romero's story is about a group of people who experience a horror so traumatic that it breaks down all societal and mental norms. Barbara is on the farthest spectrum of that trauma, but they all are impacted in some way. Barbara in Savini's remake is a strong female character, both as someone that can fight to survive and someone given much more well-developed characterization, still traumatized, just in a different way. The most telling moment is an unspoken one. As Barbara moves from a mousy and meek girl to a gun-toting survivalist, the moment of complete change is Barbara getting rid of her skirt and putting on pants. Not subtle, but it makes the transformation clear. And it's Barbara who proves that the undead can't be saved, that the best chance of survival is to run, and that both Ben and Harry have been completely broken by the experience. You can talk to me about losing it when you stop screaming at each other like a bunch of two-year-olds. Any film remake is tricky, but horror remakes face a few specific challenges. Of course, there's always the difficulty of updating the scares of an original film for modern audiences. But the biggest challenge is making something old newly relevant to the social issues of the moment. Horror movies tap into a fear experienced by audiences. Sometimes these are universal, sometimes these are cultural, sometimes these are timeless, sometimes these are very specific to the moment the movie was made. The original Night of the Living Dead is absolutely speaking to its time, coming in the midst of the civil rights movement, as Lyndon B. Johnson was escalating the US's involvement in the Vietnam War, and released after the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. While much has been made of how much was intentional on the behalf of Romero, and how much was simply the result of the coincidences of casting and timing, this context is what made the film powerful. Some argue that Romero's authorial intent should be held above contextual interpretation, as the director would say he hired Dwayne Jones simply on his acting ability, and not for the sake of commentary on race relations. I say this falls into intentional fallacy, where someone believes that a work of art can only be interpreted based on the creator's intentions, and not the impact it has on the viewer. That's dumb. The original night reverberated with audiences so hard because of the atmosphere it was released in, and how it ultimately encapsulated racial and social tensions within its literal setting of upstairs-downstairs class conflict, as the world outside collapsed. And in its final images of the surviving Ben shot dead by a posse, meat hooked, and set to burn in still images that reflect the growing news cycle that covered racial violence at home and war carnage abroad, Knight left audiences shaken. And whether he originally intended it or not, Romero would intentionally lean into social reflection with Dawn, Day, and Land of the Dead in the following decades. Outside of its timely fears, Romero created a potent monster that is timeless, the modern zombie, originally named as Ghouls by Romero. Zombies are societal upheaval that destroy the normal lives of characters and overrun the systems that keep society intact. For something so specific as the flesh-eating undead, the zombie is extremely flexible and adaptable to the changing times as, while the circumstances may change, the anxiety of large upheaval caused by disease, war, anger, hatred, racism, and so many other worldwide destabilizing movements always lurks in the back of people's minds. My stories are about humans and how they react, or fail to react, or react stupidly, said Romero. I'm pointing the finger at us, not the zombies. I try to respect and sympathize with the zombies as much as possible. 
So, back to Savini's remake. In taking the majority of Romero's original story and placing it in a semi-modern setting, and most importantly, releasing it in 1990, Night of the Living Dead loses much of its extremely timely social commentary. In retrospect, Savini and company have pointed to the film commenting on the AIDS epidemic, as the remake's news coverage points to a viral outbreak as the likely cause of the undead, instead of the original's satellite radiation. But mostly, I think the remake is without a specific social ill to point toward, and instead becomes a more generic idea of unrest and hatred. Which leaves us with more generic zombie fears, with less of a message behind them. Still, Savini's film operates extremely well as the platonic ideal of a classic zombie siege survival story. It's almost impossible to believe that only 22 years separate the original and remade Nights. The look, feel, acting effects, and overall context of the two feel worlds apart. The year 2001 doesn't yeah, seem nearly as far away from 2023. Savini's Nights seems even more miraculous when seen through the director's own experience. It was the worst nightmare of my life, said Savini. I still have nightmares of being on the set directing that movie. My problem with the remake, and the reason I call it a nightmare, is because I had a lot of ideas. I had some 800 storyboards, and the whole movie was actually shot on paper. See, George Romero wasn't there. George was off in Florida writing The Dark Half. I got stuck with these two idiot producers that didn't know anything, and their careers prove it. And you know, I didn't want to make their bad movie for them. My hands were just slapped all over the place. I couldn't do a lot of stuff. The movie is about 40% of what I intended. It would be a much better movie if I had got to put in all the stuff I really wanted to do. Not only that, but the final cut of Night is the result of major MPAA interference, who gave the film an X rating before cuts were made. With my name on it and George Romero, they were waiting for us. And they made us cut some more stuff, so it's kind of a sterile film. And that's not what the fans expected. The resulting film is pretty mild, with basically as little gore as the original. Still, Savini and company's makeup effects are amazing, with each zombie silently telling the story of how they died and where they came from. It's just that all the typical Savini blood and guts that made him a legend in films like The Prowler are gone. No more exploding heads once the MPAA had their say. And as such, it feels like a bit of a throwback, putting it further out of step with the times. The zombie subgenre goes in and out of vogue way stronger than any other subgenre of horror. Savini's film was released in the midst of a massive zombie dry spell, and outside of the rise of the Resident Evil games, the 90s were a dead zone for the zombie. I mean, they're already dead. You know what I mean. It was simply the wrong time. Savini's Night remake only made $5.8 million against its $4.2 million production budget. Essentially, the film had failed to achieve the purpose that it was made for, to recoup the profits the original had never gained due to its copyright mistake, while the original would remain in the public consciousness. In the aftermath, Romero's career would continue to stall out throughout the 90s, largely preoccupied with his Resident Evil adaptation that would never come to pass, and only revived thanks to the early 2000s zombie boom leading to Land of the Dead in 2005. And Savini, while still a prolific and successful makeup artist, would only direct a few TV episodes here and there. The remake's other intended purpose, to shore up the copyright for Romero and Russo, never really worked either, with the shaky copyright of the original leading to more remakes, including Night of the Living Dead 3D, Night of the Living Dead 3D Reanimation, Night of the Living Dead Reanimated, Night of the Animated Dead, and more. And there's also the 30th Anniversary Edition, where Russo used the lack of copyright to make another version of Night, this time tacking on newly shot footage to the beginning and the end. This is some of the worst high school class project level shit I've ever seen. Oh my god, it's bad. Sanctifying grace heals the body and the soul. I am living proof. With so many unofficial remakes and constant reissues, it's not surprising that the 1990 version has become a footnote. In the end, I think that Savini's Night of the Living Dead remake is unnecessary, and time has proven that point. Unlike other horror remakes that have either replaced the originals in the hearts of horror fans, or have gone on to become examples of what not to do when remaking a film, 1990's Night has mostly been forgotten, because the original was never in need of a remake in the first place. That said, I really enjoy Savini and Romero's update. With strong effects, good performances, and enough changes to stand on its own, it's a testament to the undying power of Romero's undead vision.
Thanks for watching today's video. Tom Savini's remake of Night of the Living Dead is one of those strange and often overlooked moments in horror history. When most people think about zombie movies, they immediately think about Romero's movies. And when they think about Romero's movies, they think about the original Night, Dawn, and Day of the Dead. After that, maybe people think about Land of the Dead, and probably Zack Snyder's remake of Dawn. But Romero and Savini's 1990 remake is a strange footnote in that larger franchise. And up until recently, it had been a blind spot for myself as well. But when I finally got around to watching it, I was struck by how much I really enjoyed it, both as a remake and as its own movie. And I really do think it deserves more praise, or at least more discussion. Because with Romero writing and Savini a close collaborator at the director's chair, it is extremely true to Romero's vision of the living dead. And personally speaking, I find zombie movie history to be fascinating, because it's constantly a reflection of social fears, and the many different changes that different societies go through over the decades. You can use Romero's two trilogies to truly reflect that, but you can also use basically every zombie movie that has come out over the years, and the amount of zombie movies that come out each year as well. As I mentioned, the 90s was a truly dry period for zombie movies, but I also think that we're currently in the midst of a dry spell as well, but I kind of suspect that it's going to be coming back in a year or two. And when it does, it'll be because of a truly visionary idea for zombies. And that'll kickstart a new wave once again. But as for the remake of Night, I think the reason it's been long forgotten is because the original really didn't need a remake, and this came out during a really dry spell for horror overall. Over the last several years, I've made videos on Romero's original trilogy of the dead, a video about what makes a great zombie movie, a video about horror in the 1990s, and a video about George Romero's unmade Resident Evil movie. All of those interconnect with this video. So if you enjoyed this and haven't seen those, go give those a watch, because it creates a really interesting web of zombies connected to Romero. And I'm also very interested in covering the Return of the Living Dead franchise, as well as Romero's other zombie trilogy, which includes Land, Diary, and Survival of the Dead. Those aren't as good as the original trilogy, but it is an interesting subject to me. And the Return of the Living Dead movies are really fun in both good and bad ways. So if you're interested in those, let me know. I'd also like to hear your thoughts on the 1990 remake of Night of the Living Dead, your thoughts on the original Night of the Living Dead, and zombie movies overall maybe give me your top two or three favorites. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. If you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews, which include a monthly wrap-up of everything that I've been watching, reading, and playing, as well as an exclusive Patreon review voted on by patrons every month. And the last few have been Akira and The Rocketeer. So until next time, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves, and don't be afraid to take a bite out of a new great zombie movie.